A study by Northwestern University tells us the United States is losing two newspapers every week. A sobering statistic, not without consequences. Senior contributor Ted Koppel takes us to South Carolina, where some papers are finding a new way forward. The historic city of Charleston, South Carolina, is home to the oldest daily newspaper in the South. Back in the days of the Louisiana Purchase, when Napoleon was making news, it was reported right here. The original newspaper began in 1802. That's amazing. 221 years. These days, Pierre Manigo owns the paper, which is now called the Post and Courier. He's the latest in a long line. My great-grandfather bought into it in 1896. Making his the fourth generation now to own the paper. You haven't heard, Pierre, but newspapers are done. They're finished. I've heard the rumor. But instead of cutting back, Pierre Manigo is bucking the trend, hiring more staff, expanding digitally across the state, and investing heavily in, of all things, a state-of-the-art printing press. Family ownership means he can do, more or less, what he wants. Are you really in it anymore to make money? No, no. The, the short answer to that is no. This is not the business to make money in. It once was, as you well know. These presses printed money, but it's a different world. One in which an estimated 70 million Americans now live in what's come to be known as a news desert. The counties in yellow have just one newspaper remaining. Those in red have none. What happens in those communities, absent a source of reliable local news and scrutiny of local officials, can lead to the spread of disinformation and corruption. We see what happens when communities lose their newspapers, because it's happening all around us. I think it's very important to have not just a newspaper, but a very good newspaper. Here in South Carolina, 10 local newspapers folded their print editions back in 2020 alone. And even among the ones that survive, many are shoestring operations in cities like Chester, a former textile hub that hasn't quite recovered from hard economic times. The weekly newspaper is the News and Reporter, and one half of its reporting staff is editor Travis Jenkins. Myself and my reporter Brian Garner, we're it. And what do you cover? Everything having to do with Chester County. So. Literally, if you show up at our office and say, hey, I just caught a 60-pound catfish, would you take a picture of it and put it in the paper? We absolutely do it. But then we also kind of pride ourselves on doing more deep dig, heavy lift investigative pieces that a lot of papers our size aren't able to do anymore. But the county supervisor is indicted for trafficking meth. Trafficking meth? Yes. The sheriff is indicted and removed on corruption charges. A councilman is removed from office by a judge for having a past criminal record he didn't disclose. How do you have the time to do that? It's difficult. Head 40 miles south and you'll come to the small town of Blythewood. That's Barbara Ball. She owns the local weekly paper, The Voice of Blythewood. She manages the paper, writes for the paper. Oh, how are you? Papers? Yep. And that's her delivering the voice to businesses around town. Barbara, most publishers have got someone to do this kind of thing for them. Right. Your vast staff is not available to <laughs> right. deliver the papers? I'm pretty much the staff. The family pitches in. Husband Keith was up a good part of the night getting the paper ready for distribution. Daughter Ashley, her main job, is as the paper's designer. And Rufus Jones here. He's the former mayor of nearby Ridgeway. He gets a small stipend to deliver copies of Barbara Ball's other paper in neighboring Fairfield County. This just gets me out of the house. What is it you find in, in this newspaper that you don't find in the New York Times? I prefer this paper because it, it, it's, it's the truth and it's what's happening in the county. That's why most people get this paper. You won't be surprised to learn that Barbara Ball does not do it for the money. But sometimes out of the blue, she gets some very generous donations. I will get checks from people. I've gotten $1,000. Really? I think most people realize that we don't make 
a lot of money. We don't make any money. And I think a lot of people think if we weren't here, they might not know what was going on. Coming up with the money to pay for real reporting, that's a problem they all have in common. From the small rural communities to the big city paper in Charleston, owned by Pierre Manico. Newspapers were a great vehicle for advertising. That's gone. So now you have to go back to what the roots of journalism are, and that's content and information that people can't get anywhere else. Do you actually think that anybody cares anymore? I think they do. How do you know? Well, we opened up a fund through the Community Foundation where people could pay for the newsroom expenses associated with our investigative journalism. We set a goal of $100,000 in 100 days, and we raised about five times of that. $500,000 from readers who wanted to support the work of award-winning investigative journalists in this newsroom, led by Glenn Smith, the special projects editor. He has a team of five reporters, including lead project reporter Tony Bartlemy. In 2021, it occurred to Tony and Glenn that they could use a part of the donated reporting fund to help some of those small, struggling newspapers in other parts of South Carolina. They could collaborate to everyone's mutual benefit. We actually spent some time working on a pitch. Remember we wrote that out? We came in with a lot of humility and said, hey, we're putting together this project, we're calling it Uncovered, and what we like to do is investigative stories, and you can collaborate with us if you can and if you want to. Travis Jenkins from the Chester News and Reporter was the first reporter they reached out to. Tony Bartleman told me, hey, we're about to drop this story, and we do mention Chester Sheriff, and I don't want you to feel like we're invading your turf or trying to Bigfoot you. So here's literally everything I've got from where we investigated Chester Sheriff. And later on, when the sheriff was going to trial, we had some trouble staffing that trial, and he was going to that, and we shared reporting on that. And then the pieces that we produced were so much better for the collaboration. The Uncovered project ultimately involved 19 community newspapers across the state. Two papers have since folded. The stories ran in Charleston's Post and Courier and were available to all of the local partners, including the voice of Blythewood. Barbara Ball, her local school superintendent, had basically taken over the narrative of town. I'm not going to deal with you. She wanted to see his financial spending records and came to us. Some governments are just great. They're very open. And then there's others that do have things to hide. And it's very hard to get information. She'd been quoted, I think it was $300 for these records, and she didn't have that. And so we offered to pay that, and they ended up just giving it to us when we got behind her and got a really good story out of it. What is it they provide other than money and muscle? For our story to be on the front page of the Charleston Post and Courier was huge. It substantiated that we're a good newspaper, that we turn out good work. I don't know some of these towns. I know nothing about them, but these people do. So why don't you take the best of both worlds, put them together. We all get content raise the alarm, and, and hopefully make our state a better place. In the last few years, our corruption work has exposed a half a dozen public officials, from sheriffs to prosecutors. It's triggered more than 10 state investigations and audits, more than 100 stories that have exposed conflicts of interest and cozy deals. It's really that cumulative effort that ends up creating that culture of deterrence that prevents future misconduct. And readers seem willing to pay for that extra effort. Over the past two years, Pierre Manigault's Post and Courier has raised more than $1.7 million to fund their investigative work and local partnerships. Ten years from now, are newspapers going to be a thing of the past? Time will tell. I think that there's a second life for newspapers. I think that we'll survive this. It's, it's an evolution, and newspapers just need to evolve to the new digital world, and I think we're well on our way to doing that. Travis Jenkins has a different measure of success. His readers can renew an annual subscription of his paper for $29.99. Somebody took the time to take this mailer. One of them returned the offer with an editorial comment. 
in between the spaces on our little mailer, it said no. <laughs> I do not want to, and I'll have to do a little judicious self-editing here. I do not want to subscribe to your bleeping paper. Y'all are the most up in everybody's bleeping business newspaper I've ever seen in my whole bleeping life. Didn't sign it, didn't put a return address, but I wish he had because I wanted to write him and say, man, thank you. <laughs> That's the best compliment anybody's ever paid us.